Real communication occurs and the evaluative tendency avoided when we listen with understanding. Understanding, that's an interesting word. Because you might ask yourself, well, what do you mean when you understand? And it's got this sort of physical aspect to it, right? That's the stand. And then there's the under part, which sort of implies that to understand something is to be under it and standing. And so, partly what happens is if, if I can listen to you with understanding, what that means is that I get a clear enough picture of what you want so that I could change the way that I am. That I am. Maybe the, the way I look at things, the, like the perceptual scheme through which I view the world, but also my actions. And if I can extract that from you, then I understand. I would be able to take what you told me and change myself if I felt that was appropriate. Or maybe it would just happen automatically because now I have a deep understanding of you. And people are afraid of that, right? Because let's say you've got yourself all hemmed in with some ideology and you're feeling pretty secure about that and then you listen to some dimwit who's got completely the opposite perspective from you and you listen hard and all of a sudden you've got cracks in your system. You know, and then you have to think, oh, maybe things are more complicated than I thought they were. Everything isn't all tied together in this neat little package, and that can be unsettling. It's unsettling. To, in fact, if you're listening to someone, and you're really listening, and you're not being unsettled, the probability is pretty high, either that you're not listening, or that you're not talking about anything of real consequence. Because if it's important, and you're listening, it's going to shift you. You know, so there's this, it's going to set you into that, at least a little bit into that state of chaos. And what you're doing then, just so you know, is that instead of identifying with who you were, which is the person that you were before the conversation, you're identifying with the person you could be as you move through the conversation. And that's a way better thing to identify with, you know. You're going to identify with your beliefs, this is a Piagetian idea. Are you going to identify with your beliefs, or are you going to identify with the process that allows you to generate beliefs? And often those things are in contradiction. <coughs> Because if you identify with the process that allows you to change your beliefs, then you're, you're, you're assaulting your beliefs, even though you might be correcting them. But it's, it's, it, it's demanding to do that, because you're reconfiguring your physiology. And there's an intermediary period of uncertainty that goes along with that. What if they're right? Well, then what? It's like, yeah, well, then what? Real communication occurs in the evaluative tendency avoided when we listen with understanding. What does this mean? It means to see the expressed idea and attitude from the other person's point of view, to sense how it feels to him, to achieve his frame of reference in regard to the thing he is talking about. So there's also, Rogers is very, emphasizes very much the, the idea of embodiment. So you can listen to someone, you can listen to their arguments with your mind. It's a very logical process. It's sort of a rational and logical process. And in some sense, that's what you're taught to do, for example, when you debate. And the idea there is that, you know, the argument is, is a cognitive phenomena, and that the, the logic is structured in a logical way, and that the way that the argument is settled by is by the exchange of information and the relative coherence of the two perspectives. It's a very rationalistic perspective. And it's very useful to be able to debate, don't get me wrong, and, and to have your mind organized so that you can put forward a logical argument. It's like, that's why you're in university, so to learn how to do that, believe it or not. And, but it's not the same sort of thing that Rogers is after, because when Rogers talks about the interactions between people, it's embodied. So like, if I'm really watching you when I'm talking to you, paying attention to your face, you're going to be like expressing emotions with your face screen, because that's what it does, right? Your face expresses emotions so that other people can infer what it is that you're up to, even more than you know. Because if you knew, you could just tell them you wouldn't even need emotions. But what the hell do you know about what you want? That's why you're having a conversation with someone, it's to figure it out. So you're watching them like mad, and you're watching their posture, and maybe you're mirroring them. And, and you can do that consciously to some degree, but it's probably better if you just do it unconsciously. And then when you're mirroring them with your body, then you can feel what they're feeling. And then you can start to draw inferences about what it is that they want by noticing how you're feeling. This is often one of the things that will stop people dead in the source of a conversation. Because the other person will get upset. And then you'll watch that, and then that'll make you feel upset. And then you go, oh, I can't deal with this anymore because it's too upsetting. It's like, well, hmm, 
maybe the fact that it's upsetting is actually an indication that you really should deal with it. You know, you can't just run away. If it's upsetting, upsetting. Something's being flipped over. That's why it's upsetting. Well, you don't want to bail out just because you're upset. It's like, you know, clue in. That's not the time to quit. You want to maybe detach a bit from your emotions so you don't get drowned in them. So you can use them in an informative manner, but you don't want to stop. That's, you got things going then. Stated so briefly, this may sound absurdly simple. Well, I didn't state it so briefly, but it's not. It's an approach which we have found extremely potent in the field of psychotherapy. It is the most effective agent we know for altering the basic personality structure of an individual and improving his relationships and his communications with others. If I can listen to what he can tell me, if I can understand how it seems to him, if I can see its personal meaning for him, if I can sense the emotional flavor which it has for him, then I will be releasing potent forces of change in him. Well, so you can imagine, like, your brain is always trying to figure things out. Well, let's extend that a bit. It's not just your brain, it's your psychophysiology. It's your whole body is trying to figure things out, right? And, and you can't just think about it as a logical and mental process. Like, your emotions are, they're evaluative processes. They're trying to give you information, but they're not very articulate. You know, it's like you come home and you're all angry and you're touchy and your partner says something that's, you know, pretty mundane and you, you know, you just explode. It's like, well, they say to you, why are you like that? And they say, well, I hate it when your boots are in the way of the door. It's like, oh, that's why you're having a fit, is it? Because the boots are, well, they're always there. It's like... You can be sure that there's a big mess underneath that. And the, it's going to be hard to approach that person because angry people are also kind of, you know, they're kind of, well, they're irritable for sure, but they also have this kind of shell on them that is touchy. They're touchy. So you, if you touch them, you know, they'll get irritated at you. And so if you mirror that, if you're listening to them and watching them, then they can start to figure out that they're angry and that maybe they're too more angry than the situation demands. And if you listen to them, be angry for a while, which is very annoying, right? Because maybe they'll be angry at you. Then maybe they'll calm down and they'll start to differentiate that emotion into articulated statements. It's like, well, I had a really terrible day at work. Well, what was so terrible about it? Then they'll tell you a story. And then they'll say, well, that's happening all the time. And then you ask them about that. And then they say, well, my boss is unreasonable in his demands. And so then you ask them about that. And you, and you find out that the person either has a tyrant for a boss, because sometimes that happens, right? A real bully. Which when, and then the answer to why they're mad about the shoes is because they should change jobs. 